Well, hello. Welcome back to Fairs Come Follow Me, Faithful Answers to New Testament Questions. My name is Jennifer Roach. Today, we are going to talk about authority. Um, authority is a big topic in our church. and uh, Evangelicals, they have no idea what we're talking about or why. And we don't actually know what they're talking about for the most part or why. So we're going to talk about that today. It's a fantastic topic. Um, our purpose here, as always, is not to fuel debate or help you argue with your evangelical friends or relatives or strangers on the internet. The point here is to help you understand where they're coming from, why they think what they think, so that you can explain things from our faith to them in a way that they can understand. The, the whole point of this is to is just be able to have better conversations where they can actually hear you instead of people just talking past each other. So today's scripture comes from Luke chapter nine, and we've got verses one and two. This is from the NIV, ESV, maybe English standard version. Um, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, you and I, Latter-day Saints, hear that verse, and, and we point at the word, see, authority. And look, he's sending out his, his apostles. Apostles need authority. There you go. What more do you need to know? But it gets, it gets sort of confusing um, for evangelicals. So a common evangelical question that would come up here is something like, why are Latter-day Saints obsessed with authority? They would say that in their churches, authority comes straight from Jesus and it's interesting because there were several spots in this week's reading where the people around Jesus are starting to question his authority. Under what authority are you doing that? Like we, we've seen this start to happen in the gospels and it continues on until his crucifixion, right? His authority is, is a big deal to the New Testament people. And in our church, we do talk a lot. We talk a lot about authority, proper authority, priesthood authority, general authorities. Like, like it's it's a word that I think it's used in ways we don't even we don't even know how much it gets used because we're so used to hearing it. So people want to know under what authority Jesus is doing what he's doing. Your evangelical friends kind of want to know why are you claiming all this authority when we've just got like the Bible and like, why are you making a big deal about this? So I want to explain how they see authority, what they mean by it, how our point of view might actually end up being a blessing to them. So first, my Latter-day Saint friends, I know that as we talk through this topic, what is going to come up in your mind is the Bible is not completely translated correctly. The Bible is not completely trustworthy, Right. I get you. I am with you. I am not fighting you on that by any means. However, if you're going to hear what I'm going to say, I need you to set that aside just for this video, just for a minute. We're going to focus on the parts of the Bible that you would say are translated correctly, that are inspired, that truly show God and his character, right? So when I refer to the Bible in this video, try to resist the impulse towards, but the Bible's translated incorrectly. Therefore, this is invalid. You'll, you'll, you'll see why we'll get there. So next thing, this topic, we're going to get a little bit heady. We're going to geek out a little bit. Stay with me. There is a payoff, I promise, but we got to lay some information down first and, and stay with me. Um, if you have been following along with these videos, you are starting to see that because evangelicals hold to a certain set of values, they prioritize things a little bit differently than we do because we hold to a slightly different set of values. So when evangelicals use the word authority, it is most often in the context of the authority of scripture, and, and they mean the authority of the Bible. And they put a lot of effort and priority into demonstrating how and why the Bible is a source of authority. That is a it is a thing that takes up an awful lot of their energy. The same energy that we might use to talk about priesthood authority or, or other versions of authority. They put that same energy into understanding authority in, in the Bible. So this value for them, it goes all the way back to their Protestant roots. At, 
it, the Reformation was about a lot of things, but at least part of what it was about was the question of who gets the final say? Who who interprets scripture? Is it the Pope? Is it the priests? Is it the individual? Who? Right. So so that's part of what's going on in the Reformation. Prior to the Reformation, which was not a singular event, it was a process over many years. Um, but prior to the Reformation, authority was contained within the Catholic Church. Very few people had access to physical Bibles, and few few people could read anyway. And and frankly, very few of them had time to devote to very much study anyway. Their lives were primarily about what needed to be done to sustain life. Um a leisurely kind of sitting around and studying scriptures is not easily compatible with an agrarian lifestyle where your family is going to eat or not, depending upon the physical labor that you do, right? So prior to the Reformation, the world is not really set up in a way where people are long-term, daily, consistently studying the scriptures. So before the Reformation, the Catholic Church holds all of the authority to tell people here is what the scriptures say. Um, it, it, the, scriptures, the scriptures mean what they say it means, right? Like if the Pope says it means this, it means that. And nobody has the ability to check his work, right? And, and honestly, it wasn't just Martin Luther who saw some of the contradictions between what the church was saying the Bible said and what the Bible actually said there are a number of priests um during his time and before who who saw that and were were even writing about it but it is martin luther who really had the courage to take that whole conversation public right and he does it in spectacular fashion and he happened to have excellent timing if he had been born even a hundred years earlier his argument just wouldn't have mattered because there was no way to get scriptures into the hands of average folks. The printing, the printing press is what enables the Reformation to happen, right? Like this is this is seventh grade history. You you know all of this already. But Luther comes along and makes a really, really good point at a time in history when there's a technology to apply it. And it booms, right? And this is a really good thing, right? For 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 humanity, for our spiritual development, to be able to say, wait a minute, what my priest is saying the Bible says and what it actually says are two different things. This is this is a good thing, right? However, what happened when the Bible itself, what or what happened was that the Bible itself is now given the ultimate authority. The church sort of takes a back seat anyone with the after the printing press anyone with an education could now read the bible their level of understanding of the, the context and what they were reading it didn't really matter all that much they weren't all really all that concerned with it because the bible itself was the authority and as long as you read it with a plain reading the Bible could replace the authority of the church. So this concept is referred to as sola scriptura. You might have heard that phrase. It means scripture alone. And it is a very high Protestant value, and it is a very high evangelical value. Um, if, I, if you haven't heard me say this, evangelicals are a subset of Protestants. So sometimes we talk about evangelicals, and sometimes we talk about the, the larger group of Protestants. Evangelicals are a very specific type of Protestants. Um, so the idea for them is that God is the ultimate authority. He has given us a book called the Bible, and therefore the Bible now sort of contains God's authority. But it's kind of, it, it's kind of a, it, it's a different way to look at it, right? And, and here's the problem. We don't say, for God so loved the world that he sent us a book, that feels really cold, kind of kind of lonely, kind of distant. We say God so loved the world that he sent his son. Right? And evangelicals say that too. Their, their, their version of John 3.16 is identical to ours, right? Um, it, but this doesn't quite, quite click for them in the same way. Let me explain to you what all of that means, the implications of all of that. Sending his son 
to earth came with all kinds of messiness and pain and difficulty. But the experience Jesus had while on earth was a very human experience. Um, it, it seems odd, right? That God would go to this great messy length to send us a son and then expects those who follow his son to not have a human representative, but to have a book, an, an object that now contains the authority of God. It, it, it's a weird pivot. In our church, we believe, but, but as do really the first 1500 years of Christians, that the authority to act in Christ's name is located in human beings that God gives that authority to. Why is it important that they're human beings? Well, because they understand the messiness of life. A book doesn't, a book doesn't understand anything. It's an object, right? So further, without even taking into consideration the problems of translation and transmission of the Bible, all written words have to be interpreted by humans. So you only sidestep the problem a tiny bit when you put the authority in a book. You still have to be a human and translate it. You have to take the written word and understand what it means. And that requires a human mind. There is no bypassing that. Um, there isn't a reality where God just like dumps his, his scripture into your head and you perfectly understand it. Um, Michael Ash has a fantastic book on this, Rethinking Revelation, the Human Element in Scripture. You can buy it at the Fair Bookstore. 700 pages explaining how this works. If, if you are curious about this, um, Michael's work is excellent. Um, God's project of communicating his message to us has always involved humans, evangelicals and Protestants want to place it in an object, not a human, at least in our day. So what do we, what do we mean when we're talking about the authority of the Bible? It's easy to see how some problems can develop for evangelicals straight away, right? When a book is the container for God's authority on earth, instead of a human being who, re, who represents him, problems come up. The biggest one is the question that says, how can an ancient narrative hold authority over modern people who don't understand the culture or the context that it came from. So here's what evangelicals do. And, and it's pretty interesting. They simply want to open up the scripture, read what it says, apply it to themselves, the end. Or, or so they think they understand themselves to be doing a plain reading of scripture and that within themselves is all that is needed for understanding. They are their own authority on the Bible. Anybody who understands differently than them is at best sort of dull minded or at worst, maybe they're outright evil. Um, but most of the Bible is not a list of things to do. Or, or things to avoid, or even things to be believed. It's a story. It's a narrative. And even when lists of things to do or not do or believe are presented, they are presented in the context of a story. But if you can't understand the story, you have no way to understand the do's and the don'ts or the beliefs. It's kind of this grab bag approach. Just, just reach in and, and grab out what you need. And it doesn't matter what the text itself is actually doing. Um, evangelicals want more than anything to, to have a high view of scripture, to value scripture, to respect scripture. They, they, they sincerely want that. However, by placing God's authority in a book of scripture, they are inadvertently giving themselves a low view of scripture. Let me explain. Evangelicals think about the Bible as something that represents God. He's placed his authority in the Bible. So when they say authority of the Bible, it's kind of a shorthand for God has authority. He's vested in this book we call the Bible. We turn to the Bible to learn what we need to learn 
from God the authority, right? So when they say authority of the Bible, that's what they mean by that. But in our church, whether you have words to describe this or not, we think about it the other way around. Um, it, it, N.T. Wright, actually, who's, who's not a member of our church, he's an Anglican, N.T. Wright makes the same point in some of his writing. We would say that according to the Bible itself, authority is vested in God. God gets to decide what to do with it. And the narrative of the Bible shows us over and over and over again that God vests his authority into his representatives. To say that now God vests authority in a book, an object, it takes a complete left turn from where the story of the Bible is leading you. You want to take the Bible seriously? Then take the Bible seriously. It tells us the same story over and over and over again. God has a message for the people. He uses someone to take that message forward, right? First, he uses the prophets of the Old Testament. Then he uses Jesus. Then he uses the apostles. And we even see Paul, who did not know Jesus in person. He, he was not one of Jesus's disciples. He's a later addition to the apostles, but he's still called an apostle. And God vests authority into him to carry that message on. It is actually a very low view of scripture. Because what it's saying, what evangelicals are saying is God's plan that is within the pages of the Bible where he cooperates with us humans to do his work isn't good. They feel, evangelicals and Protestants feel ambivalent about that plan. And they want to change, in a sense, that plan and let God take his authority and put it in a book because that is very nice and neat. And you don't get um, figures like corrupt priests or a pope or or any other whatever to kind of come in and trick you into thinking the Bible says something it doesn't say. This is 500 years leftover baggage from the Reformation, right? We still haven't gotten away from this. Evangelicals and Protestants in general want to say God's plan that he lays out in the Bible is he takes his authority and invests it into humans. But we now know how terribly wrong that can go and how dangerous and how frightening that is. So we're not going to, we're going to, we're going to eliminate the human part and put it in a book, right? I, I, I get the impulse, right? I, if you know enough about like 2000 years of Christian history, if you know enough about the specific history of any, of any church, humans make things messy and mess things up and hurt people and get it wrong and all of these things. And God doesn't seem all that worried about it. He still vests his authority into, into humans, not objects. So what about our evangelical friends? They want, de they desperately want to get things right about God. And having everything all neat and tidy inside of a book seems like a really good way to do that so that they remove authority from human leaders and put it in a book. They are, they're trying to keep things pure and not let humans mess them up. And it is an understandable goal and desire. The problem is that it's not God's desire. God partners with us messy humans to create and to organize and to lead and to remove authority from the humans God partners with and place that authority in a book it might feel safe, but it's not God's plan. In, in other words, Jesus gives authority to his apostles in the story. That, that's what we read in Luke 9 this week, right? And evangelicals are saying that's scary because humans mess things up. Don't you remember the Reformation? And they're not wrong. Humans do mess things up. But the answer isn't to change God's way of operating in the world. The answer is to try and get better at following the pattern God has laid out in the Bible for us, listening to his representatives on earth. Evangelicals desperately want a high view of scripture, and I commend them for that. But they undermine themselves because they pivot away from scripture from what scripture is teaching us, the, the pattern that it shows us, God has authority, he vested in representatives who help people follow him. They pivot and say, God has now put it in a book.
book. Um, think of it this way. The Bi- evangelicals, evangelicals love this idea. The Bible is kind of like a five act play creation, the fall, the story of Israel, the story of Jesus. And then the book that we call the acts of the apostles. That's the full name of the book of acts. And in the acts of the apostles, the gospel is to be taken to the ends of the earth. Um, acts, the book of acts, you'll see when we get there in the, in the new Testament readings, it doesn't have an ending. It just stops. Right. Um, and, we'll get there there's some reasons for that but christians have always interpreted that as and the work goes on and the acts of the apostles should go on it's strange that we we don't call it the acts of the bible we don't call the acts of the book We call it the acts of the apostles. Books don't commit acts. They're objects. Everything in the Bible is intended to teach us how to carry out the story of the Bible, the narrative of the Bible. And that includes God's desire to place authority in humans, not books. There you go. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, Come back next week. Bears come follow me, New Testament, and we'll do some more.